from Microbe TV. This is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 50, recorded on April 8th, 2024. <laughs> Vincent Yellow, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hey, Vincent. Good to see you, everyone. Welcome back, Vivian. Thank you so much. Good to see you. From New Orleans, Vivian Morrison. Hey, everybody. And from New York, NYU, Tim Chung. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's great <clears throat> to be here. Um, very nice and sunny day. I hear the not, sun's not for long. Yeah. Not for long. <laughs> yeah. How's the weather in New York? It's a little bit cloudy. It's getting, it was yeah, like really nice here. and clear this morning, and then it got increasingly more and more cloudy. So I don't know whether we'd get any. Um, so for the listener, today is where, uh, when the eclipse is going to occur. But hopefully we get something here. Um, so it's many school get children's darker. eyes will be protected by those clouds. <laughs> okay, <yes. laughs> They're like, don't look at the sun. So Jason, are you going to go outside and look at it? Well, uh, here in Salt Lake, it's only like 50%. So, um, yeah. What are I, uh, we, I did, Jason, I did see and know? photograph the last one in 2017. That yep. was epic. So, yeah, you sent the picture. It was amazing. Yeah. No, it was... <laughs> uh, I, I should have done my, I mean, the, the thing with this one is that because of where, where, where it goes through in America, um, you, you had to have bought like flights if you wanted to get there early mm. because flights were just insane. Um, so sadly, uh, uh, I missed it. Oh, you're, and you're considering driving. Well, I guess that was even more yeah. insane. How long would it have been for you to get somewhere where to drive? To get like 20 hours. <laughs> oh, because I was going to say, I think in Baton Rouge, which is an hour away from where I am, there's a, I don't know if it's perfect, but it's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the south to so Texas, although it looks like um, bummer for Texas, it's cloudy uh, for most of the state. So Ooh, yeah. they have to, like what they did for the last uh, eclipse and hire a plane and go above the clouds. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's what I should have done. <laughs> <laughs> With all of your extra cash <laughs> from your extremely well, you, lucrative you actually, academic job. Um, I think a couple of commercial airlines did have uh, special flights that you could uh, be a part of where they would just fly along that route. Oh, oh cool. <laughs> like yeah. A thousand planes mm. just hovering. But, uh, Tim, <laughs> Tim, what's the timing in New York City? Do you know? I think it's about three, uh, plus, maybe three plus or minus one hour. Don't quote me on this. I didn't look too carefully. Plus or minus an hour. Wow. Because uh, I, I didn't check. I think it's around three. So uh, like once <laughs> this is done, I'm going to check a bit more. I think more. The, peak, the peak is at in about an hour or so. I mean, it, it, it would depend on where you are, are, right? Like, um, yeah, in New York, I think. Oh, okay, uh, really? Oh, I'll have to yeah. go check. In which or case, let's. An hour and a half. Yeah, I think here, it, it, t yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what what, what right. about Salt Lake, Jason? What, when is it starting? In about less than an hour? Yeah, something? I think it started now and then it peaks in, in about an hour. Okay, all right, well, we'll do. For today, we have a, a paper that combines viruses. In the central nervous system, and I'm not doing it. It's actually Jason. <laughs> <laughs> he brought it to the table for I you. I did. Uh, yeah. Well, the, it caught my attention because it um, it talks about SARS-CoV-2, which of course is the, the the virus that causes COVID, and the title is "Brain Exposure to SARS-CoV-2 Variants Perturb Synaptic Homeostasis." Um, now, I'm interested in synapses, so. Uh, that caught my attention. And, uh, you know, I think there's been some interesting papers that have um, suggested that that SARS-CoV-2 can infect cells in the brain. Um, but there's some controversy of, you know, trying to disentangle cause and effect here. And that's very difficult to do in humans because, of course, you have to rely on mostly autopsy kind of um, studies. So this this study, I think, will bring up some interesting um, points and observations, but also, I think, quite interesting in terms of the approaches they used. Um, so this is from uh, a French group in Montpellier. Um, the first author is Emma Pot Potio. 
I don't know how to pronounce these. <laughs> and and Raf- the last author is Raphael Godin. Um, and this was published in Nature Microbiology. Um, and really what they wanted to set out to do. So there's, like I mentioned, there was this co- controversy of do um, SARS-CoV-2 viruses, virions actually infect cells in the brain? Is there uh, enough infection, enough replication happening that there could be, you know, causative uh, effects? And we know that um, both acute and chronic forms of uh, uh, COVID result in neurological deficits. And, um, you know, the, the classic one initially was that people would lose their sense of smell and taste. And um, that was before, you know, the vaccines came along. But even vaccinated folks now, there are some symptoms that are associated with um, getting COVID. And it's really this sort of long COVID um, uh, symptoms that are concerning where some some people say that they get brain fog for weeks to months. Um, there's also sort of personality and psychiatric disorders. There's an increase in, in the uh, prevalence after getting COVID. Um, so, you know, this is, I think, a big issue to tackle in, in terms of so many people have had COVID. Um, is there really... Um, effects on on the brain that are sort of direct from the virus or are they all are they indirect because you just have an inflammatory response and your immune system gets activated so you know i think there's obviously a lot to figure out here but uh important topic yeah, so um, i, I want to point out that early in the pandemic uh, here on twin we had an episode with I forgot his name but he worked on uh olfactory epithelium and um probably bob data Bob data, yeah. That data, right? <clears throat> he was saying that the, it's the name. sustentacular cells that are infected, not actually the neuronal cells, right? Yep. So, um, okay. So th- in this um, paper, they uh, delve into this, and um, they use a combination of techniques. And the first technique they co- they use is something called an organoid, which I I think we've discussed before. Um, but essentially, the, you can isolate cells from a human, and usually these are blood cells or fibroblasts from skin, and then you give them a cocktail of um, uh, goodies, usually um, some transcription, transcription factors that can convert those cells into stem cells. And those stem cells then... Um, you can direct them to uh, turn into different cell types, even neurons. Um, and we talked about these these uh, iPSCs, these uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, and they've sort of revolutionized a fair number of um, fields in that you can now uh, pretty easily study human cells and even neurons. Uh, and then the sort of, you know, next step of... Um, the, using these stem cells is that you can put them in a dish where um, you can encourage them to form uh, what's called an organoid where in, in the case of neurons, they can start to connect to each other. It's a 3D culture, as in you've got layers um, versus a 2D culture, which is basically putting cells on a dish. Mm. Um, and the idea is that these 3D cultures, these organoids maybe have a little better um circuitry they you know they connect to each other that you can start to see uh, neuronal activity but the big caveat here of course is that you're just still planting cells together they don't have all the cell types of the of the actual brain um and th- that circuitry is just random it's not directed so there's going to be uh, a lot of caveats of what they see Jason. but it's human cells Jason, I've got a question. Do you know whether yeah. um, in 3D organoids culture, well, or I don't know whether you call it culture or not, um, growing 3D organoids, do they have both uh, excited, I'm guessing they have like excitatory neurons, but do they also have in- inhibitory mm, neurons? That's a good question. And if not, does it have like epileptic seizure, similar type of activities? Yeah, so uh, um, there are types of organoids that do include inhibitory cells. Um, and, but that's a good question for, I don't think I ever picked up on this, 
uh, and what the technique they use, whether mm. they they. Um, I don't think they labeled for excitatory versus inhibitory for this. Um, no, I bet they you just that it doesn't. So this, I, I bet you that that heterogeneity doesn't exist in the natural prep, you know, because they come those types of cells come from different progenitors, mm, right? Mm. They have different transcriptional profiles. So. Exactly. So mm. I, I, I bet think, you have to and have I think like this is just a straightforward mm. uh, organoid uh, protocol. So I don't think they included those. So this is mostly excitatory neurons that they're they're looking at. Um, okay. They do show that the this organoid also includes astrocytes. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the glia cells that are supportive. They don't initially include uh, microglia, and they'll talk about that um, uh, because as that's well. from a very different progenitor cell. So yeah. So you have to add those separately, yeah. exogenously. Um, so, so they grow these organoids and, you know, they grow them for a couple of months. It takes a couple of months for them to get um, form <laughs> this sort of blob of tissue. Why are you laughing, Vincent? You spend a couple of months growing them and then they get contaminated and you have to yeah. start. Like, ah. I, yeah. <laughs> they put in a lot of uh, anti, uh, anti, anti microbe and antibacteria. Yeah, which I'm, it's just not good for cells either. But, you know, and they're <laughs> so We're doing expensive. I mean, the medium is expensive, right? And yeah, this is not not a cheap exercise for sure. Yeah, it, it was an investment. <laughs> so then they um, they infect uh, these organoids with um, SARS-CoV-2, and then um, did a bunch of experiments um, from uh, looking at the at, at both sort of um, gene expression changes, protein expression changes. Um, they do see um, low levels of infective infect, infection and, and, um, you know, so the abstract's kind of interesting where they say, um, let's see, they, uh, they see, we find that neural cells are permissive to SARS-CoV-2 to, to a low extent. Now I'm like permissive to me means like, then they can get infected, but then they add a qualifier of low extent in them. So I'm like, what does that mean? It should be either you are or you aren't. <laughs> kind of, it's like, like you either if, if let I, it happen you know, or you don't let it happen. When I would, you know, they could see uh, some infectivity, but not a ton. I'd have gone, oh, okay, well, Vincent, we'll move on. From Vincent, here. is the right word here susceptible instead of permissive? So susceptible you means you have a receptor, and permissive mm -hmm. means the internal environment is, is supports viral replication. So huh. if you want to make infectious particles, you have to be susceptible and permissive. So, I mean, <laughs> they... Um, you know, they measure by PCR, but mm. they also say they don't, they hardly find any infectivity. They actually do, they do, uh, do some assay. infectivity, plaque assays, yeah. which is what very few people do in these kinds of experiments. So I'm very impressed by that. Yeah. But is it possible for the virus to get in and then make viral protein like they show, like they did some staining and they saw some viral protein, but at the same time, <clears throat> it's not infectious still? Like, it doesn't get released. Sure. Oh, sure. Okay. So is that, that a word for that? I'm guessing that's not so, a word for that. I mean, but. permissivity means you make infectious virus. You go through the whole cycle. Mm -hmm. but they just <clears> say <throat> propagation is pretty low. The, mm -hmm. the, so you, they're, yeah, permissive, permissive environment that can make the virus, but propagation in, in the organite itself seems low yeah. and so inefficient. They say that, uh, you know, they make very little virus. I didn't look at this extended data, figure 1E. E. Did anybody look at that? The um, question is, no. <laughs> is there a time zero? <laughs> hmm. And if there's not, you can't conclude anything. And does the, does the titer go up more than a half a log? Because if it's a half a log, it's just random. It's not, any, it's got to be at least tenfold. So that's, hmm. that's, I didn't have access to the extended data. Does anyone have it? Yeah, so they, um, they do uh, have a time zero. Good. And um, they look at four days after and 10 days after infection. And let's see, there's a log scale, but uh, that goes from like 50 to 100. So, <laughs> how much does the virus the go up? Is the that difference how much is it goes? 50 to 100. Like, yeah, that's, that's twofold difference, right? Twofold. So, that's, so, the problem is you can you add virus and then it doesn't replicate but you're just measuring the input virus right mm -hmm. yeah and that can go up slightly experimental error or whatever so uh, that tells me it's not even clear that it's making any infectivity 
Right. Mm-hmm. So you could potentially just achieve the same outcome by just injecting, by just treating the cells with the pro- viral proteins, right? The, the same if, outcome in what sense? Yeah. Like um, that, <clears throat> you know, you're they're putting the virus in there, but if it's not replicating, um, and it's and nothing is changing in terms of the presence mm-hmm. of the viral proteins, right. then my, then you know, take us out of BSL three or whatever, and just do it in your do <laughs> oh. it in your lab where you can just throw <laughs> they, proteins on there. They do talk about it later on where they like irradiated the virus and repeated some of the experiments, <clears throat> so they killed the virus and, did, and see what would happen. Mm. And like what did research. they find? We'll, we'll yeah. find out when it comes oh, we'll, to that. We'll get there. Okay, so, sorry. <laughs> uh, just to finish this sort of characterization here, they so they. Um, so they say, you know, in re- agreement with observation, there's almost no infectious particles were detected in the supernatant that you can collect from the organoids. Mm. Um, it's and, pretty telling. Uh, and as we said, the, the virus propagation isn't low. Um, there was no significant cytotoxicity or apoptosis, so that cells weren't dying. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind. And um, they also saw no growth defects and they also saw they s- say that the low in- amount of infection that they do see is only is mostly in neurons not in glia mm-hmm. so um so you know the model here then says okay they can get some low amounts of virus replication and neurons and uh but it's not super toxic like the cells aren't immediately dying uh so then they looked at uh what i thought was interesting so a lot of these um these sort of newer kinds of uh, papers will jump straight to RNA sequencing where they look at gene expression and transcription. Here they actually went straight to the proteomic um, profiling, which I like. So they're now actually looking to see what proteins are altered with infectivity. And the, the conclusion here was that most of the proteins that they see that are altered and increased are synaptic proteins um, and they concentrate on, so as, you know, rem- reminder, synapses have two sides, the presynaptic terminal, we have neurotransmitter release and the postsynaptic terminal where most of the receptors are. And what they noticed was that most of the synaptic proteins that were increased were on that presynaptic side where you get neurotransmitter release. Um, and so they then went to look at what, whether there was any functional or morphological changes in synapses. And they use this uh, protein called bassoon. Uh, <laughs> there's a couple of interesting, so there's bassoon and there's piccolo. Um, I was like, what about oboe? I think there's or, an oboe as well. <laughs> I don't I know why there's no, yeah, I would have loved to see the whole orchestra. Wouldn't that be great? Um, <laughs> I think, but I think it's just woodwind. And I'm wondering, like they do some staining of this oboe protein, like in the organoids. And it does look like long strand, like long sticks. You mean kind of like an oboe? Like, <laughs> so maybe that's why they call it like all these woodwind. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> generally, I would say they don't really look like um, you know the instruments that they're. Oh, supposed to. it's only after. Oh, it's only after SARS-CoV two. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So normally yeah. they're just punked. Uh, you know, there's there's sort of roundish. Uh, so anyway, so that's uh, Tim. Uh, Tim uh, got to the punchline there. So what they noticed was that there are there's an enlargement of the synapse, this presynaptic terminal, and for some sort of weird reason, they're not only bigger, but they also are longer. So they have this weird shape. Um, um, that's actually, that's Jason, really a phenotype I've not really ever seen uh, before. The phenotype is so like the picture is so different. So not ever seen in COVID or ever. Ever. Really? Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know what to make of that. What is bassoon? Like, what is it? Where where would we expect it to be? Like, what, what is, role is it playing in the synapse? So is it's it a like very a- big protein. It's 420 kilodons. And um, it's both ma- ma- mostly thought to be like a scaffold for a bunch of other proteins. So it sits there at the synapse and, and a whole bunch of other proteins interact with it, and dock with it. And um, without that machinery there at the presynaptic terminal, we get um, deficits in neurotransmitter release. Mm-hmm. Um, and usually, you know, the size of the synapse correlates with the uh, how much neurotransmitter can get released. And, um, you know, so it's sort of indicative that there is something going on there. Um, and, 
so we'll get back to this um, functional, they'll do some functional experiments, but the next experiment- You know, well, before you go on, let me just comment that. It would have been nice of them to try some other viruses, right? Maybe mm -hmm. <clears throat> viruses that are never known to get in the CNS and others that are known to get in and see if they do similar things, right? Right, yeah. that's mm -hmm. true. They don't. Um, they, they didn't have any other. Yeah, that's the only one. Viruses in there, and so this the kind of phenotype's not clear if it's specific to SARS-CoV-2, or would you see this with other viruses? And also, that can affect and also, viruses? it would also be nice if they would be able to co-label the bassoon, which, you know, in the infected guys, it's all elongated and weird. If they can co-label them with like a, some SARS-CoV-2 protein so that you can see if it's actually the infected cells that are showing this phenotype. Uh, well, they do do that uh, uh, next. So they, they look for variants and they do see, we'll go into that, but they oh, look, okay. they find that there are small puncta of SARS-CoV-2 that do correlate with um, the presynaptic terminals. Now, I don't know, and they kind of did some, you know, frequency, distribution there with uh, the size of the, the bassoon as well. Okay, okay. So that's in figure three. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so they, um, so they sort of bring up the point that we talked about that organoids are immature, like they, they're, they're not really, uh, you know, modeling a, a proper adult cortex <laughs> or, or system. And so this this is something new. So what they do here now is they actually had um, pieces of brain that were excised from living humans um, for for various Under what reasons. What circumstances? <laughs> don't I don't think know. they did no. this. And now, of course, you couldn't get permission to just do this for for this experiment. I, usually, there's uh, surgical reasons why they're taking out bits and pieces of brain. Um, but what they do then. Um, is they take those pieces of, of cortex and they actually culture them. So, oh. Sorry, um, Jason, just to quickly butt in, these aren't surgically removed. These are post-mortem brain slices. Oh, they are post-mortem. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is surprising to me because... But still um, immediately post-mortem. Well, between 12 and 24 hours post-mortem, like if you check out the methods mm -hmm. at the back. Um, what? Which is interesting because that's kind of exactly ah. what. Um, so that's one of the one of the the advances of this paper is that they can try to culture post mortem brain slices, and they describe in the discussion that you have much better supply, um, sadly during a pandemic of post mortem brain slices than yeah, you know I surgically I, I taken. Think I out. was skeptical of that, so I was like, it can't be. <laughs> it is post mortem. <laughs> Um, which is yeah, weird I can, because I like in slice electrophysiology, Jason, you know much better than I do, like we use post-mortem brain slices from mice and then we don't really normally keep them for more than one day after the experiment. But here they're growing it for like maybe a week at least. Well, like. so actually there are, um, uh, it was one of the workhorses of hippocampal slices was that you can make these what they call org organotypic slices and you can culture them for weeks. So, ah, so that okay. is that is not mm -hmm. been so that is an established technique that that electrophysiologists have used um, for for a long time. Mm. Um, but of course, there you can control when you take out the brain mm. um, uh, versus autopsy, where if you're lucky, you're not going to get you know access until like you know thirty minutes after the. Um, I think, the, I think so, this is hours, perhaps. I yeah. don't quote me on that, but yeah. Wow. So kind of surprising that it works, but it, they they show that um, yeah they can culture these pieces of brain that they've taken. I, I was kind of a, a little annoyed with, um, and you know, but this is common in papers where they they don't really go into this um, technique in detail. Even in the methods, you have to read like another two or three papers to. I, completely understand what what they're doing mm -hmm. um and then there's has and it has this like acronym opab which they don't even explain what that oh, is i think it stands for uh i'll have to look it up oh organotypic yeah. post-mortem adult yeah. human brain slices yeah yeah um okay so they so they so they grow these brain slices um well not grow them but they they culture them so they're now um they slice those pieces they're in 
a, a tissue culture incubator. Um, and so then they do the same kind of experiment that they just did with the organoids. They infect different um, pieces with um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and um, they show similar things in that um, this leads to viral RNA expression um, and, you know, initial, the, the, yeah, they're just using PCR. Um, but that there were close, two of them, so they, you know, two of the, the uh, pieces that they had got from different human um, humans, they barely detect anything even with PCR. Mm. So, so again, this is really low levels of expression. Um, and yeah, hmm. kind of similar to what they're seeing with, with, um, with the organoids. Hmm. Uh, but then they wanted to see if this synaptic phenotype was, um, also, uh, evident in, in these pieces in these guanotypic slices. Um, and they, they, so they say that they couldn't see, they couldn't look at overall protein levels of bassoon, for example, because it's so big, uh, which is, I guess, true. Um, they did look at mRNA and the mRNA levels weren't correlated with the infection. Um, so they, but they do see overall this increase in presynaptic terminals. Um, and so then they, they're sort of thinking, okay, well this, this at least, um, seems to, you know, uh, replicate what they saw in organoids. So now they want to delve deeper into what, what's going on with this synaptic phenotype. Um, and so what they do now is they try to figure out, are there any, you know, interesting mechanisms here. So now they're going to concentrate on, a protein called latrophilin. Um, and latrophilin is actually a, a, um, a postsynaptic GPCR, and it's, but it's involved in the, the development and formation of synapses. Um, and they see that this is uh, one of the most upregulated proteins in, uh, in their organoid model um, and in, the, in this, uh, these organotypic slice cultures. Um, they also see an increase in mRNA for this. So these latrophilin, so latrophilin, um, it has this name actually because it's a target for some venom, um, and, uh, some, I think it's spider venom that can actually attach itself to this, um, receptor and interferes mm -hmm. with neurotransmission. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they, they, um, then look at, um, whether the this this function whether um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 can affect the function of this latrophilin, um, and they see that you know they look at the downstream signaling of this uh, GPCR, which is looking at cyclic AMP, and um, they do see an increase in cyclic AMP when they infect these cells. This is now in a cell culture model, not in in the brain slices. Um, and then they have like this small peptide that um, that had previously been shown to sort of antagonize this uh, latrophilin downstream signaling. And when they give that to the cells that were infected with SARS-CoV-2, it down it reduces this overactivation of the Sorry. receptor. Uh, Jason, I think it, the peptide that they use is an agonist actually, so it activates lat latrophilin receptor, I believe. Mm. Like on the, um, on the abstract, it says agonist. It's so an I'm agonist, guessing. but it's uh, it's um, but it, the it's consequence those, is that it it um, it can't continue to turn over, so it just gets like. But it, it increases. Oh, sorry, Vivian. Oh no, I I was just gonna. I, you know more about this than me, without a doubt. So go on. <laughs> oh. I don't know anything about like I've, just, I've never heard of latrophilin before, but it increases. Like, I think the agonist increases cyclic AMP production, which kind of made me guess that it probably is an agonist, like probably a GS coupled GPCR. But um, yeah, it's just on the abstract. Um, it says it's an agonist. Yeah, it did say it was an agonist, but you know sometimes you can have like um, 
you know, what is that? You can basically max out a receptor so that like it can't, like the, in the, <clears throat> the value of the receptor or part of its function is that it can be turned on and turned off and turned on and turned off, mm -hmm. um, you know, successively. And so if maybe if you have this agonist it, based on like whether or not it, it binds and it has a really high affinity or something like that, it can actually like prevent yeah, that I cycling, right? Which could lead to a kind of antagonistic effect, even though in terms of the pharmacokinetics uh -huh. and all of that. And yeah, like a partial. I think agonist. That, yeah, because a right. partial or, agonist. Um, reverse agonist or yeah. something like that? Well, I think it's complicated because this this kind of GPCR is is, um, is activated by a receptor. And so um, they talk about this the receptor, which is FLRT3. Flirt. Flirt. Flirt 3. <laughs> I don't know if that's how they say it, but if they're not, they're missing an opportunity. Um, <laughs> and so this peptide interacts with both of those. So it... it yeah, but as as you said, it enhances cyclic AMP ex, um, induction, I guess. Mm -hmm. right. Anyway, yeah, it does something. Um, well, what they found was in um, so in these cells, we found that SARS-CoV-2 significantly increased this statal, which is what the peptide is called, induce cyclic AMP levels, um, even in UV inactivated samples. Um, so then they, so this was in, you know, then they went back to the organoids and then they showed that they give this peptide to, they apply it to these, um, and that increased cyclic AMP production. Um, and it somehow reverted the phenotype of the presynaptic enlargement in the SARS-CoV-2 infected cells. Um, so then they use that as a way to conclude that this that the virus-induced presynaptic abnormal abnormalities are dependent on this latrophilin signaling in some way. Um, mm. But that's where they sort of left it. They don't um, really go more into how that actually, you know, why you would s expect to see um, this enlargement of the synapse if you overactivate this or underactivate this uh, receptor. Mm, they have they have a little bit of speculation in the discussion. Um, yeah, but yeah, maybe we can get to it when we get to the discussion later. Yeah, so um, you know, I think up until now, that's the, what they've just looked at is uh, the size of the synapse, and um, they you know that. There's only so much you can you can figure out from that. So then they wanted to look at neuronal activity, and what they actually do here is that um, they kind of use a, a now it's called a sort of now it's a common way of doing this that you you have basically electrodes that are underneath the culture dish, and um, they can sort of record the population responses of the cells in that dish. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of a quick and easy way of looking at um, neural activity. It, I would say it's not super, the, the resolution of this is not great. I would like to have seen um, much better sort of resolution where you're actually looking at specific synapses like patch clamp electrophysiology where you can actually figure out exactly what's happening um, at synapses. So this is just a mm -hmm. population response um, I, I presume that they did this because it's doable for non, you know, expert neuroscientists. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not sure there's anyone here that that's, you know, you know, that, that's all I'll say. I would like to see more resolution there. But um, what they do see is that um, when they record <clears throat> um, that the LFPs, these population responses are altered in um, CoV-2 infected organoids. Um, and they sort of go into some detail about what that looks like, but I would say it's not clear what those, are. there is alterations, but I don't know what those alterations are actually showing you with this particular method. Yeah. Cause like, if you look at, <clears throat> so the difference is probably because they're literally sticking electrodes into an organoid and no one really <laughs> know what it's supposed to look they like. They don't know where, where they're where it's going. Or like what it's supposed yeah. to look like. What is it supposed to look like? But if you it stick it in, like if you lunch. stick the electrodes into the brain and measure LFP, um, uh, look a few potentials. Um, normally people plot like on the X axis, the frequency and on the Y axis, the power. 
and think of it like you know like almost like an acoustic fingerprint of like someone's voice like if someone is really bassy it will have a lot of power in the low frequency if someone's very high pitch it will be a lot of power in the high frequency mm. um and in the in the brain there's like a very characteristic shape and you can look at different brain waves this is what brain wave is about like is it in the alpha range or delta range theta range all those stuff um they don't really show that in the organoid so we don't know what the brain wave in an organoid actually looks like um yeah yeah sadly. i doubt it looks like anything in particular unless you give the organoid more information about how to wire itself oh but i don't know if people have tried to do that yeah but it would be interesting to see because i think um how the brain wave looks like might depend on like how the exactly how the circuitry is wired how many like synapses does the brain jump through before it goes back to the same neuron again that kind of stuff and it would be fun to see what it yeah organized. i mean i think you know that's why i would have liked to see single cell resolution here because then you could look at you could sort of get the the actual functional properties of the synapse versus this population response which is always going to be very random in an organoid that's randomly you know the circuits themselves are random. But Jason, have you seen any paper where they patch clamp from an organoid? Yeah, ah, actually, I actually have okay. a colleague here who um, Alex uh, uh, Lovatov, who who's done this uh, a lot in his organoids. Oh, so it's and, definitely doable. And they they look relatively reasonable. Like it seems similar to normal brain. Yeah, classes. I mean, you can see. Yeah. Okay. Reasonable. Well, okay. Uh, I think you can't tell anything about circuitry, but but they're functional. Mm, mm. Um, anyway, so they, they see perturbations, there's differences in the neuronal activity at a gross level in, in these organoids when you infect them with COVID. Um, and then I think, interestingly, they do add that peptide, that stachial <coughs> peptide, um, and that seems to revert the phenotype. So they, it does, uh, uh, the, the, they correlate that the synaptic, um, the, you know, the reduction in the size of the abnormal synapses with this functional output. Um, so um, then the, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so uh, they do, do they do anything to show you where the bassoon is located in the cells? Um, because I know that like in the normal, a normal neuron, right? We know where bassoon would be. Um, but... Just because we see in like this more bassoon and it's in strange shapes, can we really confidently say that there are more synapses? Um, uh, because even like the changes in activity doesn't necessarily mean that there's more synapses or I, and since we're we're not seeing anything that like fills up the neuron to show us where the spines are, maybe there's a problem with bassoon trafficking or turnover. and like, did how confident are we that there's actually a like change in the number of synapses and it's not that like the changes that we that they see um electrophysiologically are caused by just kind of clumping yeah, up of I stuff mean, in the I cells in random that, places that kind of characterization they did not do uh that goes to and that goes to tim's point as well where they didn't really look at like other synaptic markers per se um and whether there's differences in total numbers of synapses, the postsynaptic side. No, they did. They did yeah. look at PS. They did have one graph where they PST looked 95. at um, postsynaptic density protein ninety five. It's a, a postsynaptic protein uh, marker. But I think that was just um, expression levels. I'm not sure. I don't. Oh, that's true. Don't, that's mRNA. Yeah, but, I don't think they actually yeah. looked at staining. I guess no. I'm just curious because, like, in the organoid situation, and I, the organoid situation, they make the point that they mention that um, it's more like an embryon, and Jason mentioned it earlier, it's more like an embryonic brain rather than a mature brain. And in those very early stages of development, the systems in place for plasticity are really robust. And so I would expect to see big changes in things like synapse number or dendrite um, branching or, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. But in the mature brain, like in these postmortem, this organotypic slices that they have, um, it's interesting to see the same changes, the same kind of, you know, 
protein expression changes occurring, but this is in an environment where there are a lot of signals saying don't be too plastic. I mean, we know that like if you have in order to drive plasticity, you have to have repeated excitation of particular mm -hmm. networks. So that's what makes me think like maybe we should take a step back and because you can achieve the same outcome, the same like changes in bassoon localization, et cetera, um, without changing the number of spines just by kind of mucking up the the neuron as a whole, like a traffic jam or something inside. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that it really matters for their conclusion. Maybe it does or it doesn't. I don't know. I, I, I didn't make it halfway through. The, I only made it halfway through the paper. But Well, I would they, say this next experiment kind of gets at this a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of want to, I do wonder how they landed on this latrophilin. I mean, other than the fact that this latrophilin was upregulated, I guess that mm -hmm. was the main way they got yeah. into it. But um, so they, so they want to know, so why would this virus affect this particular signaling at synapses when you're not getting a ton of actual vi viral replication? Mm -hmm. So they, they hypothesize that it may be direct, that there's actually the, the virus itself somehow interacts with the um, this signaling co uh, co compartment or synapses or the proteins at synapses. Um, so they uh, look at, they do this uh, protein um, proximity labeling assay to see when they add virions, do the virions actually... Um, get into the synapse or are closely uh, close to the synapse. Um, and so this is a, a technique where you can sort of say that if you do see a, a fluorescence, there's an interaction between those two proteins, spatially at least. Um, so they even use, UV, as Tim said before, they use UV inactivated virions, and even those accumulate at these synaptic compartments that then are they stain with latrophilin and um, the the flirt three, um, and so they they see a co-localization of the the virions at synapses with and in particular these uh, the synapses that are stained with these proteins, um, and so they sort of conclude that. Um, they think that the virion somehow interacts with, with specifically with latrophilin 3 um, and that they get trapped there or there's some sort of physical interaction that then alters the signaling of, of the, those two, um, uh, the, the flirt 3 and the yeah. latrophilin. It's quite nice. I saw, so they actually showed, um, so yeah, just to re, re, some, reiterate Jason's point, the, the latrophilin and FLIRT3 are kind of like a couple and they talk to each other. They kind of are, I guess, uh, FLIRT3 is the, they say it's the receptor for latrophilin, but they talk to each other and they act as cell adhesion molecules so that the mm -hmm. presumably the presynapse would talk to the postsynapse and kind of couple together. And it seems like um, when they added the SARS-CoV-2 virions, even even virulons that's been like uh, UV inactivated, um, when they kind of sprinkle it in, the the virus or the virion kind of gets in, but they keep getting associated with a flirt three. Like like wherever the flirt three goes, the virion would go, and it kind of sticks around the flirt three. And hmm. the authors seem to propose this is like when we they discuss in the discussion, um, the virus. What the virus is doing is it's getting in the way of FLIRT3 and uh, latrophilin 3 the two cell adhesion molecule. And when that happens, the pre and post synapse, they're like, oh, they don't talk, we don't talk to each other anymore. We must make more of each. So that's why you see increase in expression of both, both FLIRT3 and latrophilin 3 um, And mm -hmm. when that happens, it seems like that might correlate with the increase expression of bassoon because it's trying to find or like presynaptic markers because mm. the presynapse is trying to find its postsynaptic partner and the SARS-CoV-2 virus kind of in the synapse is getting in the way. I think that's the assumption that they're making based on the data. Yeah. So, 
and then they sort of hypothesized that that um, the spike protein of of CoV two is somehow doing this, although they weren't able to show a direct interaction of the spike protein with any of these protein with the synaptic proteins. But that's what mm. they mm. discussed. Can I ask something? That can I ask something that might be like kind of uh, like out of left field, maybe? And it's also it's a question for Vincent. Do we know anything about um, uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 infection during pregnancy and how much like the virus can be found in the placenta or anything like that? Your as knowledge? Far, as far as I know, no. There's no transplacental crossing. But, okay. I mean, it's it's more lethal in pregnant people because they're typically immunosuppressed, right? Right. So Especially. the reason I bring this up is because I, I uh, have heard of latrophilin um, and I think flirt, but definitely latrophilin. Um, and I don't know if you, any of you guys have seen these papers, but they are um, two proteins that are necessary for um, homing of neurons from in in from certain places from one place to a, another place in the hippocampus, like latrophilin three mm. expression is is restricted to certain places, and it's necessary for axon homing to those regions, so connectivity. And so I was thinking, you know, an interesting, like totally off the wall I idea of an experiment based off of what Tim was saying was, what if you take a er very early developing Hippic brain organotypic slice. If you put the virion on there, if you put the spike protein on there, can you disrupt normal circuit formation mm. of the hippocampus? Because you're, or can you, and can you also drive like increased expression of latrophilin or FLIRT3? And so you, do you guys, I, it's kind of just off the wall, but I, I had had, I had heard of latrophilin before and I thought that, you know, since it was, it's associated with circuitry mm. in the hippocampus that it would be um, kind of a cool, could could provide a, a cool so way to thing test some of these ideas. To me is inconsistent is to, to say that these interactions are driving neuro-COVID, it doesn't, it, there's not a lot of virus around. So I don't know how that would work, right? If they see very yeah. few, very small numbers of particles and they <clears throat> they actually look in some, some of these post-mortem brain tissues and they find clusters of particles, you know, even people who don't have symptomatic COVID. So I just don't know if the amount of virus particles that we see is consistent with them having some kind of interrupting effect. You know, I don't know how many synapses would have to be perturbed mm. to get some outcome. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a good point. I think, um, you know, to be honest, though, you don't need a ton of uh, synapses to get Okay. To, to, to have a functional effect. But I think the jury's out with with this mechanism here because they don't really go into um, more functional experiments. Yeah. This was the last real, real experiment they did. Um, and they, they acknowledge that. And, you know, I think it's I think it's worth following up on this. But, it, it, you know, um, even if you get um, and I, of course, you don't really know. I think the problem here is also. Do the, does the amount of virus in the brain correlate with the symptoms? Mm. Um, if you have, if you, if it is the, the case that the the virions themselves get trapped at synapses and they stay there for a while, maybe you don't need a ton of infectious virus to do that. Um, and then, you know, over time, if maybe perhaps some people have more of these uh, virions hanging out than others. Um, but yeah, I think it's. An interesting hypothesis, and certainly the this latrophilin singling um, could be worth looking at in, in a more sort of functional mm -hmm. model. And they talk about, you know, of course, doing some of the, these experiments in mice and, and sort of really delving into it. Yeah, they mentioned using the peptide that would activate mm -hmm. um, like latrophilin, and you know, they show that it brings down the bassoon, the presynaptic expression. Um, and some of this um, kind of pathology in the EEG recording. So maybe that's one of the drug. Um, but what's interesting is um, they actually did another experiment we didn't have time to get into, but maybe I'll quickly bring it up here. In the like figure one or maybe figure two, they actually showed that um, in organotypic slice, even when you add in, sprinkle in some SARS-CoV-2 and you get drastic increase in bassoon and presynaptic terminals, 
if you then add, if you also add some uh, monocytes, so uh, mm. these are kind macrophage of macrophages from the blood cells. that you can extract from patients. Um, if you add some monocytes in that access infiltrating monocytes, um, you can actually drastically reduce this increase in presynaptic mm. density. Um, so that mm -hmm. suggests that. Yeah, and so that and that and that's um, you know well known, of course, that the microglia what they can do is they prune synapses and they, mm. um, especially if they're sort of uh, in disease context, what's known is that they they can eliminate so sort of the, the 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 bad synapses. Right. Right. Um, but or even the healthy ones. That's a major problem. Where <laughs> you you sort of want to maybe get rid of some bad synapses, but you don't want to get rid of all the synapses. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there there's also evidence for overactivation of of microglia and and pathology like Alzheimer's. So, mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. But I, I was wondering. So so the whole thing about the purpose of this is that in the brain organoids they don't have they lack microglia. Um, so when you add in the the infiltrating monocyte, then it can do its job and get rid of the kind of surplus presynaptic terminals. Um, it's interesting that in patients you still see increase in presynaptic terminal, even though they presumably have monocytes mm -hmm. flowing around. But well, the monocytes well, might be busy. Oh, microglia. Oh, that they have right? microglia saying, in the you brain. You mean in their in their culture or in the ah? So the patients in the when they were yeah, alive. Yeah, when you say patients, the, the, yeah. when they were alive, they would have monocytes in the blood, and, unless they are well, all recruited to combat the disease in the lungs. But I um I would be I mean typically unless they had some major br blood brain barrier leakage. You would not see. I don't. I mean, I don't think you would see a lot of infiltrating mm. monocytes. You would. You might see, kind of, like. The, but there would be existing activity. microglia. Um, it, it, yeah, that's what I was going to say. But, but I think those the, are actually what's really um, known about rat and mouse organotypic slices is that when you culture them, there's actually a massive increase in synaptic numbers, and there's new connections made that are abnormal. And so that's actually one reason why that, that technique has fallen out of uh, favor because um, if you're looking at circuit again, they, they, they sprout all these abnormal synapses. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it is interesting. I actually don't know um, off the top of my head if there have been any experiments looking at microglia and these organotypic slices and how normal they are anyway. <laughs> Uh, Vivian is doing that yes. right now under, <laughs> no, under, under, under the yeah, microphone. I mean, yes, it's yes, right as, camera, I'm, as we yeah. speak. No, um, as yeah, I've, that's definitely like um, there's so many unanswered questions about microglia in the developing brain, and then you know, Jason was saying, yeah, it's well known that microglia and also astrocytes uh, contribute to synaptic pruning, but like it kind of ends there. Like, there's not a lot known about how it happens in the developing brain. Um, I actually wonder if maybe there's not more known about it in diseased conditions. Um, yeah, I, I would say I, yes. I think it's, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think it, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm working yeah, on yeah. One, one sort of easy hy hypothesis to come up with here is that when those synapses get trapped with virions, there's probably this eat me signal that gets expressed so the, the, the microglia can selectively one would think perhaps remove those yeah. those abnormal synapses, but they don't show that here. I think all, another variable to take into account is that, um, you know, there's going to be, we know that the endothelium, we know that blood vessels um, are directly affected by SARS-CoV-2. And I think if, I, I, have, I haven't read much on this in a long time, but they are like, a, I think a place where the virus can replicate pretty easy or like it gets into the cell through the like um angiotensin receptor right mm -hmm. H2, um yeah. and so like the one thing a couple things like their organoids don't have blood vessels in them the organotypic slices do um so i, I would ex I kind of expect there'd be differences between those two assays but um like the brain is always has blood vessels. So I'm kind of like, well, the organoid is cool and can maybe help us get get to look at some of those really, you know, fine-grained interactions between proteins. But at the end of the day, if we're trying to understand neuro-COVID, 
we have to look at everything together, which is going to involve the blood vessels and um, the relationship between the blood vessels and the microglia, because they will talk to each other. And so if you have systemic inflammation, that is going to activate, you know, indirectly, yeah. the message is going to get to the microglia. So in their, uh, in their system here with the organoids, they're adding um, kind of like, we'll just say like naive, um, quote unquote, monocytes, um, which may not reflect what the microglia actually look like at the during infection so the and the phagocytic ability and then the cytokine production ability of the microglia will probably will changes as the as the cell becomes activated right so, um, so you know there's there's very little virus in the blood in a during covid oh, so mm -hmm. okay. even though the virus <clears throat> can re reproduce in uh endothelial cells it's not clear that it does. That's because, not the place so where the, it happens a lot. So you, these clotting issues that you see, you know, and vascular damage, <clears throat> you see them throughout the body and, you know, in the legs is in, even where there's very little virus. And so the idea is that they're inflammatory processes. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not direct results mm -hmm. of virus. And in fact, in, in the, one of the studies here in this paper, they had, they had um, <clears throat> brains from people uh, with COVID and they, they end up, they, they make the comment that it's not likely that virus got there through the blood for various mm. reasons, you know. Mm. Yeah, they don't have viremia. Else. No viremia yeah. and other things. So, so it's just cytokine, the whole cytokine storm thing. <clears throat> you know, I mean, that, that could even explain this, right? <laughs> the the neurocovid, mm -hmm. um, they they seem to discount it, although because they say we've looked for inf neuroinflammation in COVID, we don't see it, but other people do. So, I mean, that's the easiest explanation because the side might also can get in right it might also depend on where they're looking in the brain i mean the brain yeah. has got so many different places <laughs> at so many different times at so many different in so many different conditions it's like well you know and different parts of the brain are vascularized differently and the endothelial yeah. cells at those regions have different properties so different tightness of the blood brain barrier different, yeah. different potentially susceptibility to certain mm -hmm. cytokines so I'm like, you know, it, uh, we're just, yeah, everybody has to look I mean, at the entire thing. I think brain. that's the problem, right? Is also, of course, in mm -hmm. if, if patients have respiratory or hypoxia, I mean, that we know, mm -hmm. of course, has uh, a lot of downstream effects on the brain. So it's yeah. always complicated. Yeah. You have to really know what, what's going on. And there's probably multiple ways to get um, but brain and cognitive damage. One thing they don't talk about is if you actually go through the supplemental data, because I wanted to see what's going on. Um, for the post-mortem organotypic slices. Um, a lot of the COVID patients got um, uh, steroid it's treatment, like corticosterone, it. before they died because they mm. are severe COVID. So maybe that would affect like any inflammation that might happen in the brain. So yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a complicated, yeah, it's a complicated. And then you don't know like what happens to all these cytokines if you take the brain out and put it in a dish for like a week. Um, sure. So yeah. yeah. No, that's but, a you good know, I give, point. I give this group of kudos to trying to really tackle this at different ways and um, and and looking directly in human tissue, um, even with all those caveats. I wonder cool. if they could um, get induced pluripotent stem cells from patients with or without long COVID and see if they would <laughs> respond differently to like SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. particles mm -hmm. or virulons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah, that would be interesting. So what I take from this. <clears throat> is that the, these neuronal cultures are really poorly su susceptible and permissive, very little virus. So it's not like polio where the virus replicates like gangbusters in neurons and destroys them and that's why you get mm -hmm. paralyzed. It, it's not like that. It's far more subtle. And I don't think, I don't think the, the amount of virus that we see, if you can extrapolate it, you can't really, I don't think it would be enough to cause uh, the, the syndrome, but hard to know, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Vincent, but I think I think it dispels the notion that there's gangbusters replication in the brain, right. which is in, which is yeah. Important. I feel like that's a the take home, a take home message that we've gotten a few years after after COVID is that like um, your neuro COVID symptoms or your long COVID symptoms are independent of how much is how much may or may not how much of the virus may or may not be or have been in your brain, and it's also yeah. not correlated with your the degree of peripheral like inflammation that you had like there are people who had mm. you know very mild 
COVID uh, respiratory symptoms that then have cognitive effects and then yeah. others that just got slammed by it, um, had to be hospitalized, but didn't have, um, don't have long COVID. So I think it's like, I, I see this paper as being like a, it's a, a small, small piece in the puzzle. Um, although I always try to think about like, how are we going to use this down the road? And it may not, I don't know if you guys see there's being any sort of eventual clinical utility or if it's um, just going to help us learn something about how um, peripheral immunity and I don't know. Yeah, uh, so, the, you know, I think um, that, you know, perhaps this peptide could be used, but my worry is that that peptide is going to have a lot of nonspecific effects and mm. um, affect all synapses and how would you target the 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 bad synapses i don't know so yeah i wonder if there's a uh, viral on uh, affect peripheral nervous system because there are also synapses there but if what uh, vincent said vincent mentioned is not sars cov2 doesn't go into your bloodstream so it probably doesn't circulate you know a lot so yeah it probably isn't relevant I mean, it's not an it's not an essential part of the pathogenesis mm. With any infection, you're going to find something in the blood oh, okay. because it's inevitable. Mm. Whatever, if it's replicating in your upper tract, it's going to get into the blood and just circulate. But it doesn't mm. mean that it's going, it's bringing it anywhere else. <clears throat> you know, for some viruses, the viremia is an essential part of the, the disease, right? Mm. Measles gets into your blood from your respiratory tract and then goes to your skin and you get the rash. Mm. So the viremia is essential for that. But mm. I, I would think even with flu, you could amplify some RNA out of the blood doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very interesting yeah well I think uh, we're done do you think but like <clears throat> so so <laughs> this virus particle seems to interact with things in the synapse and another viral linked particle capsid which is a uh, arc seems to kind <laughs> of do a lot of stuff at the synapse is that just like a, a general oh, case Tim. of Tin. Synapse and capsid viral. <laughs> well, <capsid>. No, <laughs> uh, this is a common theme. So, so rabies virus interacts with something at the synapse, mm -hmm. and we still don't know what how that ha um, what that protein is that rabies. Because uh, you know, as you know, rabies preferentially infects neurons and then jumps from one neuron to another, um, and that mechanism is still not clear either. Mm -hmm. So this is mm. so viruses and HSV. I mean, many of these neurotropic viruses um, affect synapses, and some require synapses for their transmission. I guess it makes sense because there's a lot of uh, exocytosis, endocytosis occurring at the synapse. Yeah, but then you I mean, still... HIV though, for example, does not infect neurons per se. So the the mm. most of the the reservoir of, of HIV variants are in microglia or glia. Huh. Which glia? I <laughs> think microglia. <laughs> microglia. Okay, but then I was like, at, don't they need CD4? Um, yeah, so that's why microglia probably microglia. because they have the, okay. the right receptor. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. That's twin number 50. Yeah, 50. And uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. You can send us questions or comments to twin at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy these kinds of programs, we'd love to have your support. You can deduct it from your taxes if you live in the U.S., your federal taxes anyway. Taxes are due in uh, not too long from now. A week? Mike, so you go to microbe.tv slash contribute for various ways. Unfortunately, you can't contribute now and get a deduction for 2023, but you could do it for next year. Anyway, it helps us. Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah. Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Thank you, Jason. Yep. I still call it Twitter. You can tell that. I still call it Twitter. Oh, I didn't even notice. <laughs> I don't. I don't like X. I think Twitter no, was a great weird. name because <laughs> it was what it was. People chattering, right? Yeah. Oh well. Vivian Morrison's at Tulane University. Thank you, Vivian. Thanks, guys. And Tim Chung is at New York University. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jason. It was fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. <laughs>